Hello and welcome to tonight's episode of Rural Doctors. I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks once again for your company. Well, while the range of health services available to people in the bush is getting better all the time, there are always tests and procedures that can only be accessed in Perth. Tonight we're going to take a look at a few of the newer tests and procedures that you may send your patients off to Perth for to give you a better idea of what happens to your patients while they're here. So tonight you'll hear about vertebroplasty, graft stents for aortic aneurysm, MRI and CT imaging, applications of radiology and new treatments in electrocardiology. But first up, urologist Mr. Sid Weinstein from the Hollywood Specialist Centre talks us through the use of green light laser in prostate surgery. Sid, the green light laser prostatectomy is getting a whole lot of press at the moment in the general practice press. Could you tell me a little bit about it? It's another surgical alternative for men with an enlarged prostate who up until now traditionally, if they needed surgery, would have to have a, a TERP operation which is a transurethral prostatectomy. Um, I need to say that a TERP is an excellent operation. It's still the gold standard and widely used. It is, however, invasive. Uh, it requires a fairly prolonged hospital stay of between uh, two to five days. Uh, it has um, complications, as we all know, particularly bleeding. Uh, there's a risk of incontinence. Most people have retrograde ejaculation. And so less invasive options were looked at and the best of which at the moment is, is a green light laser. This is not a cutting operation, it's an operation where the prostate tissue is vaporised. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like boiling a kettle, yep. uh, you heat it up to a temperature and the water disappears. Okay, and when you're doing a terp you're actually scraping or cutting with a knife? You're cutting with electrocautery, so you're yep. actually cutting tissue which bleeds and then you have to cauterise it. Yep. Um, the idea of the laser, laser is really light energy. Why it's green is that the particular wavelength of the crystal that emits this light is green because the haemoglobin in the prostate, which is red, avidly attracts the green. And so the light energy of the green light is absorbed by the red of the prostate. It heats up and vaporises. So does this mean that you'll get less bleeding in any operation? In fact, you get no bleeding uh, in the prostate operation, and this is one of the main advantages. The nightmare of a urologist is a bleeding prostate, either during or after the surgery. And because of the heating effect, there's a coagulation front of the light. So as the tissue vaporises, it also coagulates. And that is laser energy being applied to the prostate, and you can see how dramatically it bubbles indicating vaporisation of tissue. So when you're seeing the bubbling, you know that the tissue is being vaporised. Please note that you can see absolutely no bleeding, which is a great change from the traditional operation. The white tissue is the prostate, the red tissue is the untreated prostate, and so gradually a cavity in the prostate is going to be um, lasered out or vaporised out um, with very good visualisation, with very good landmark anatomy and with a great degree of safety. But you can now see that we're near, nearing completion. This is the capsule of the prostate. Once again, the surgeon is just cleaning up the whole area and you've now got a clear channel all the way through and you can imagine that this patient's symptoms are going to be uh, greatly relieved. Uh, so that's, you're looking at into the bladder now, a very, very nice wide open cavity no tissue in the way, totally unobstructed. This patient went home the very next day without a catheter and passed urine uh, very successfully. And this procedure is suitable for benign prostatic hypertrophy only? It's, it's meant to be only for benign enlarged prostates. We have used it in one or two bleeding malignant prostates. But classically the indication would be as a minimally invasive option for men without flow symptoms that require surgery um, in a minimally invasive way. The other great advantage is that the length of stay in the hospital is l almost just one day. There are some people who are being done as day cases, but we usually keep ours overnight and they go home the next day without a catheter. This means an early return to work, an early return to normal activities, and a less hospital stay. Quite a lot of the patients who present in general practice with BPH do in fact have flow symptoms. What makes them not suitable? Any patient with an enlarged prostate is a potential candidate for a green light laser prostatectomy. Yeah. At the moment, because the 
technology is new, we're selecting patients. And so the extremely large glands are not really suitable yet. In lots of series, however, any sized gland can be treated with a laser. There is a restriction that each laser fiber has a certain amount of energy attached to it. And so sometimes you may need two laser fibers. At the moment, we're restricting our practice to using one laser fiber. So most prostates up to 40 grams, which would constitute 80 to 85% of enlarged prostates, can be done. The other patient who may find this technology attractive is the anticoagulated patient. Yeah. And more and more people, uh, as you see and I see, are on uh, either aspirin or warfarin or Plavix because they've got coronary stents or cardiovascular disease. And up until now, we had to stop this uh, anticoagulation with some risk. It required a negotiation process between cardiology and urology and uh, vascular surgery. But with a green light laser, patients can now be operated on who are anticoagulated. Do they have the same degree of success in non-bleeding as the, as the non-anticoagulated patients? Absolutely. There's a, there, there are a number of very good studies comparing anticoagulated and non-anticoagulated patients in a randomised way, and there's absolutely no difference in outcome um, or complication rate in the two groups. Sid, finally, this technology is only available in Perth at the moment, is that correct? In Perth, Western Australia, yeah, there are a few centres over east, but uh, at the moment it's only available in Perth. We're hoping that other people come on board and that other centres adopt the technology. Uh, it's a challenge initially because you become very comfortable doing what you do, yeah. uh, but we feel that the advantage of the technology is really justified by the results. This is obviously a brand spanking new technology. Um, is this available to repat patients or just to private patients? This technology is available to any health insured patient, including uh, DVA patients. There's no out-of-pocket expense from any of the funds. Uh, our hospital covers the cost of the fibre and the um, patients are not out-of-pocket with respect to the hospitalisation. If their particular surgeon does have an out-of-pocket or a gap cost, that's separate, but the um, uh, all repat patients are covered, as are all privately insured patients. Well, it sounds like there are some definite advantages to green light laser surgery, especially in terms of recovery time for your patients. Next up, we caught up with pain medicine specialist Dr. Paul Graziotti from Cambridge Pain Medical Centre, who spoke to us about the use of spinal concrete to manage the problems of collapsed and unstable vertebrae. Paul, spinal concrete. Sounds very drastic. Who benefits from a procedure like injecting concrete? OK, well, it's, it's called vertebroplasty, and yeah. it's actually injecting bone cement. Initially, mm -hmm. uh, and still, a lot of uh, practitioners still use the bone cement that's used for hip replacements, etc. Yeah. Methyl, methyl, methyl acrylate. But I use uh, a different ceramic uh, type of cement that's used for implanting teeth. Um, the procedure is used to strengthen bones uh, and also to stop the pain from fractures or tumours. So it's used in osteoporotic fractures most commonly and patients with secondary tumours where there's usually been a fracture associated with the tumour. Right, so after the fracture how soon could you do this? It depends on how much pain they've got. A lot of patients have extreme agony and those patients I would do within a week if necessary, particularly if they don't tolerate opiates mm -hmm. uh, or if the opiates aren't effective. And most of them, of course, are old. So old patients often don't tolerate the opiates. So if they have extreme pain, then I'll do them early. But in general, we like, we like to wait a couple of weeks and at least, and some people say up to six weeks, for conservative treatment to see whether or not the pain will settle down during that time. So it's primarily for pain relief and not for actually stabilising the fracture? Well, the pain relief is probably through stabilising the fracture, although mm -hmm. there's some conjecture about that. But um, it, what it doesn't do, importantly, is it doesn't expand the vertebra back up again. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not going to reduce the deformity that's occurred as a result of the fracture. And so there is some argument that if you do it earlier, before the bone has collapsed completely down, you will reduce the amount of deformity that ultimately occurs yeah. and morbidity from this pr problem is associated with deformity. In general practice we often see patients with secondary tumours mm -hmm. that have spread to their vertebrae or to other bones in their body. Um, 
Is that also suitable for vertebroplasty? Yes, it is, provided the tumour hasn't, in the vertebra, provided the tumour hasn't eroded into the posterior, through the posterior wall. Yes. If the tumour has eroded through the posterior wall of the vertebra, then the um, cement will just extrude into the epidural space, mm -hmm. and that's likely possible. It's possible in that that will cause nerve damage. So if the tumour is contained or beyond the uh, posterior vertebral um, border, uh, doesn't matter what's happening anteriorly, then it's reasonable to try vertebroplasty, quite often in conjunction with radiotherapy. Yeah. So they'll have radiotherapy, but of course that, that takes some time to work. In the meantime, a vertebroplasty will be done just to stabilise the vertebra and give them immediate pain relief. The cement, does that actually just kind of get into the spaces in the bone? It or does. What does it, is it displacing the tumour? How does it work? Uh, as far as the tumour goes, it just displaces the tumour and gets in, in amongst the, the bony fragments and basically glues them together. Yeah. Um, it's like a semi-liquid when you inject it. Mm -hmm. So it's like toothpaste consistency. So it basically gets in amongst the, the tr into the trabecular architecture of the bone. So in an osteoporotic fracture, for instance, it'll go into the fracture line and that can be a problem if the fracture line extends into the disc, yeah. then you, have, you run the problem of the cement going up into the disc. But if the fracture line doesn't go into the disc, then this, it will stay within the fracture lines, but also spread out into the trabecular architecture of the bone, and so strengthen the actual remaining part of the bone as well. Okay, so the patient is lying on the operating table with uh, minimal sedation, because as you can see, we're putting the needle through the pedicle of the vertebra, and right next to us, is the major nerve trunks, uh, which we don't want to spear. Just behind us is the spinal cord, so we want to stay in this bone away from all of those structures. So using a very high quality x-ray, we put the needle down onto the pedicle, put some local anaesthetic in, and then basically push the, the needle through the bone into the vertebra until it's at the junction of the anterior third and the middle of the vertebra. Um, now sometimes that takes quite a lot of effort to get through the pedicle because the pedicle is often uh, got quite a good cortex on it whereas the vertebra will be soft um, and osteoporotic. Uh, and this of course is the problem. Once a patient fractures the vertebra and they drop their um, height of the vertebra, this shifts the load of the spine from the posterior elements onto the anterior elements which are soft. And hence, a patient who has a vertebral fracture has a 20% chance of another vertebral fracture. So some of the patients are very difficult to get through the pedicle, but some of them it's extremely easy and you can just tap the needle through and it's a little wonder that they don't get uh, multiple other fractures. So once the needle is in place, then um, we inject cement, which has within it a contrast medium, so we can see exactly where that's going. And then we basically, if we have to, move the needle around within the bone so as to get an even spread of cement through the bone. What other sorts of fractures could you use it for? I've performed the procedure in about a dozen patients who have had acetabular fractures. Mm -hmm. And there's a series uh, written up. Um, so these are patients with advanced cancer usually, so they've got a limited lifespan. Um, they've got a tumour which, uh, a, a potential fracture which if it occurs will render them immobile. Yeah. Uh, so if you put some cement into that area, into the acetabulum, it strengthens the acetabulum and then often allows them to be mobile. Even if that mobility is only in a wheelchair, if they've got an acetabular fracture, they're often totally immobile. You can't move them around a bit. The other group is sacral fractures. There's a procedure called sacroplasty. And again, we wouldn't do that in a patient who was coping with their pain or managing conservatively, but there are patients who have severe agony from sacral fractures. And those patients, we, we do a sacral a sacroplasty. The problem there is the fracture line often extends to the foramina and the cement can then go around the nerve roots and that can cause problems. So we use those only in patients with really severe pain. You've talked about the cement extruding into places where it's not supposed to be. Is that really the main risk or are there other um, risks that maybe GPs should be discussing with the patients? When we're injecting the cement, we can see where the cement is going. Yeah. So obviously if anything like that happens, we stop immediately. But certainly there are cases where problems have occurred because the cement has gone where it shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. uh, of the um, probably 500 cases that I've done, I've had one patient who had a significant pulmonary embolus of cement. Yeah. It was significant in terms of it caused pain. 
um, but they were insignificant in terms of its physiological effect and she recovered completely and had a good result from her vertebroplasty. And Paul, is this a procedure that's only available in the private system or is this also no. a public it's available in the public system as well, yeah. Um, I don't do it in the public system, but radiologists uh, do the procedure at Royal Perth Hospital and at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. So if a country GP were referring a public patient, we would refer via the radiology department or the orthopaedic department or by pain management? I would management. probably re refer them via the pain management centre at, at either of those places. Mm -hmm. um, and mark it urgent because the patient's yeah, in pain? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they usually will then refer on to the... But sometimes those patients will be managed with other techniques that they don't need a vertebroplasty. And so that's why I think it's better for them to come to the pain management centre where you're really asking for a, an assessment of what is the appropriate treatment of this person who's got severe fracture. And there are other types of treatment. There's intravenous calcitonin, which some people say works, um, but in my hands hasn't been terrifically effective, but it obviously works in some people. And sometimes just manipulating their medication in a more intense environment will result in a, in a sufficient outcome uh, that they don't need a vertebroplasty. Uh, so, whereas if you refer them to a radiologist for that procedure, they'll either say yes or no, and then they're back in your hands again. Thanks to Dr Graziotti for that, and it's worth noting that patients referred to Dr Graziotti for vertebroplasty for acutely painful fractures will be assessed and have MRI scans ordered immediately. They don't have to wait weeks if the referral is faxed or phoned. Next up, vascular surgeon Mr. Marek Garbaski from St. John of God talked to us about advances in endovascular surgery, in particular the use of graft stents in the management of aortic aneurysm. Marek, one of the things that GPs are seeing a good deal in particularly their diabetic patients is peripheral vascular disease. Could you talk about some of the advances that have happened in that treatment over the last 10 or 20 years? Especially the last 10 years, the advances in managing peripheral vascular disease and aneurysmal disease are phenomenal. And that's why vascular surgery is so interesting these days because it's not longer just an open surgery. It's actually a combination of endovascular surgery and open surgery these days. And I think the biggest benefit is really benefit for patients because their recovery is much faster, mm -hmm. their area of complications is much lower, and first of all, the number of patients who can be offered interventions is now much wider than it used to be a decade ago. So say if we had a patient with peripheral vascular disease whose feet were going very dusky and blue, what would be the steps that we would take and uh, what would you be doing with them? I think in the rural setting it is still possible to organise very simple and very useful assessment, which is assessment of ankylobrachial indices. Yep. We forget quite often about this uh, very simple test and it actually provides a phenomenal amount of information. It's very reliable, it's very sensitive and specific and uh, within the setting of any practice it can be easily organised. Yep. Yep. So the next step is really to think about, uh, well, how how severe the symptoms are, obviously if you have dusky feet and very short distance claudication or even development of breast pain, then you really need to get on with treatment. And the next uh, most sensible investigation will be to try to organize reliable arterial duplex ultrasound because this patient will need to have some intervention. So is that something that we would normally do in the country or something that you would give the patient a form for the city to do in the morning and I see in the afternoon? I think it's a very good thing to be uh, that one can organize from the GP practice yep. and then patient can be referred and comes to see vascular surgeon with the result of the test available that's excellent because that really just streamlined the patients to the next um, step, which is basically intervention in someone with this sort of degree of symptoms. And what sort of interventions are you talking about? Well, these days I think it's predominantly in the vascular interventions. Mm -hmm. Vascular surgery certainly is not uh, uh, completely denying the options of open surgery, and some patients, for some patients, actually a better option or the only option but we tend to offer them endovascular treatment first simply because of the fact that what's involved here is much less than open surgery. So mortality rate, the morbidity rate is much less. It's all done under local anaesthetic, so patient is awake. The procedures themselves are, um, can be relatively straightforward and for certain procedures which in the past required a bypass surgery lasting an hour to two to three hours and requiring stay in hospital for a week or so to recover. Uh, these days it can be done within 
perhaps half an hour to an hour with the recovery being excellent within 24 hours and patient going home with just a minor puncture in the groin the next day. Some of our patients seem to have multiple levels of disease and quite long segments of arterial stenosis. Are they the ones that are going for open surgery or can you stint no, that's, kind of that's, 15 that's different a, places? That's a very interesting question. Uh, when the endovascular treatment started, obviously short lesions, various focal stenosis were yeah. the only lesions that were able to be treated. So whoever had a long segment of, for example, superficial femoral artery occlusion present was pretty much uh, the fact of going straight away for the open bypass surgery. These days, it's actually very different. We are able to recanalize vessels that were chronically occluded over a distance of 20 to 30 centimeters or even longer. Technology has moved forward so fast and so far that uh, it is possible because of the equipment which is available. Mm -hmm. And probably one of the biggest advances in the recent years was development of stenting and uh, in tibial vessels. Mm -hmm. This was an area where, which was very, very difficult to manage even with open surgery and uh, quite so often... So just because they're thin or because they've because been Because they're very so small much. vessels, because they're very calcified in diabetic patients or patients with renal impairment, because the surgery is very demanding, long, and recovery rates are associated with fairly high morbidity and mortality up to 5%. So not every patient who obviously presented with critical limb ischemia and had a number of comorbidities was really fit for three to four hour op open operation to have a distal bypass. Today we can do the same uh, procedure aiming of establishing better flow to the foot where perhaps there's an ulcer or rest pain uh, percutaneously with the local anesthetic only, perhaps within hour to two hours, we can achieve uh, much better flow Recanalized vessel which is occluded, angioplasty and stent vessel which has multiple uh, level of stenosis. So the results are quite encouraging and it is due to the fact that the equipment mm -hmm. got so much better. Okay, now the stents are just uh, like metal mesh, aren't they? That's right. And then they re epithelialize on the inside. So does the patient need anything other than aspirin afterwards? Depending a little bit on the size of the stent and location uh, where a stent was implanted. So certain stents, for example, in aliac vessels where the flow rates are very high, don't necessarily require special antiplatelet therapy like uh, with clopidogrel, mm -hmm. but the patient just continues with aspirin, which is pretty much standard treatment for anyone with atherosclerosis mm -hmm. or peripheral vascular disease. Uh, however, certain stents in the smaller vessels, um, especially in tibial vessels, where we also tend to uh, deploy stents which are drug eluding stents. Yep. Um, those stents um, have to be associated with administration of clopidogrel. But this is a limited period of time when it's required, usually three to six months perhaps, uh, where the stent is fully re -epithelized. Okay, and if we've got uh, somebody who can do a Doppler in a country area, is that sufficient for surveillance? That's right. If someone feels uh, confident with doing arterial study, uh, diagnostic arterial study, then they should be able to assess um, stent or problems, potential problems associated with the stent and discovered some issues that potentially need some further intervention. Now our other big nightmare in the country areas is an aortic aneurysm that might go pop or at least start to leak um, and we do sometimes get patients who have an abdominal ultrasound for some other reason and they will mention a three to four centimetre aortic aneurysm. What sort of surveillance do they require and when do they go for stenting? 6% of older population will develop uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, uh, male population predominantly because male patients are certainly at much higher risk than female patients. So it's a serious problem because as you've mentioned, very often it's an incidental discovery. So there are no warning signs or symptoms, patients just have completely, are completely unaware of what's going on until they rupture and rupture rates are horrendously uh, high in terms of mortality, probably just 20% or less will survive rupture and be able to be offered urgent operation and being in the country that the risk is obviously much higher yeah. because quite often by the time it's diagnosed and patient is transferred this is pretty much too late. Yeah, now my memory is of patients who were kind of split from here to here but again you do this from an yeah, endovascular route This has changed, that's right. The, 15, the last 15 years has brought a phenomenal change and again with a huge benefit to patients. So these days I would probably very safely say that around 90-95% of patients with abdominal aortic aneurysms are managed endovascularly so they are managed with stent grafts. The 
the threshold for repair of the aneurysm is still the same, with, even with the stent grafts. Uh, all the mortality rates are much less than 1%. So and what's that threshold? The threshold is 5 centimeters. So it's in our Australian circumstances, it's 5 centimeters. Perhaps um, in some countries it will be 5.5 centimeters. But generally speaking, in Australia, if aneurysm reaches 5 centimeters or more, patient needs to be referred for further assessment because then the risk of rupture is fairly significant and exceeding uh, quite uh, clearly exceeding the risk of associated with the surgery, especially with the endovascular treatment. The treatment itself um, involves uh, patient admission for further assessment and that usually involves uh, uh, organizing CT angiogram. This provides enough anatomical information about the possibility of performing stand grafts because not everyone can have a standard stand graft. Are these um, people with aberrant anatomy or just... No, people with especially suprarenal aneurysm or thoracoabdominal aneurysms. So patients uh, who in old days would be very unlikely to be able to be operated on because of the fact that surgery was of such a high mortality and morbidity and very few centers will have experience in uh, operating on thoracoabdominal or thoracic aneurysms fairly safely with the good results. Here in Perth we are privileged because Michael Lawrence Brown has developed a lot of bases for endoluminal stand grafting and in fact uh, the expertise um, and experience available here allows us to do very complicated stand grafts and there are not too many centers in the world which will be able to deliver that sort of service so we are quite privileged and lucky that we can offer patients with, even with very complicated aneurysms um, a possibility of endovascular treatment which certainly gives them much better chances of survival and good recovery. Mm -hmm. Now these things look like a, um, a metal framework with a tent on it. That's right, yeah. They look uh, quite uh, interesting and daunting sometimes when you look at them. So we can suddenly deploy things uh, which uh, once they open up and uh, deployed look just like this example of the fenestrated strand graft. There's usually some metal framework which is mm -hmm. either made of nitinol or stainless steel and there's some impermeable material which is sewn to that uh, framework. This is all collapsed to the little tube which is measuring on average around five to seven millimeters in diameter. So it can be delivered via a very small incision in the groin or sometimes even percutaneously. Mm -hmm. And the uh, procedure itself still requires general anesthetic but the risk of major complications is much less than 20%. Uh, in fact, mortality is less than 1%, whereas open, proce open procedures will be associated with at least 5% mortality, so it's a big gain for the patients. It takes for the very standard stand graft to, to perhaps uh, to be com completed, it takes approximately an hour and a half to two That's hours. Considerable so improvement on it's the faster. old aneurysm surgery. And most of the patients will just have two small incisions in each groin or even sometimes just a percutaneous, completely percutaneous procedure with no even incisions required. So, uh, Marek, this, this fabric, this is the same as the, um, the mesh for a stent, you just need aspirin afterwards? That's right. Uh, these materials are uh, very safe not to be necessarily associated with anything stronger than aspirin, so aspirin is absolutely sufficient to be continued in those patients. They don't need to go onto warfarin and they don't need to go into uh, onto treatment with clopidogrel either. Fantastic, and then we just uh, manage their cholesterol and their other risk factors as we normally would. It's very would. important, yeah, so we can't just stop at the, uh, at the level of procedure saying now everything is fixed and everything is fine. They still need management of their risk factors, so they need to be managed in terms of their hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, smoking. all of this, all of this, <laughs> and smoking. That's, that's very important, one of the main risk factors for development of aneurysmal disease. So once we have that under control, the likelihood of further problems uh, is much, much less. Mary, that's great. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Again, some real advances there that are having a direct impact on the quality of the treatment patients receive and the outcomes they can expect. And thanks to Mr. Garbowski for speaking with us. Well, our next story deals with a very different aspect of cardiovascular medicine. We caught up with cardiologist Dr. Rafiq Sami at St. John of God Hospital and asked him about new treatments in electrocardiology. Okay, so Rafiq, could you explain for us what the ablation procedure involves? Or well, the um, ablation procedure basically is a procedure that's been devised to treat um, arrhythmias, mm -hmm. and you can treat either supraventricular tachycardia yeah. or atrial flutter, or more over the last 10 years, atrial fibrillation. Yep. They all change in the complexity of the procedure with the supraventricular tachycardias yep. being 
fairly simple to do with high success rates and a low complication rate to more complex procedures for atrial fibrillation that tend to be longer, associated with higher complication rates and also with a lower success rate. Yeah, and so your aim really is to, to cure it permanently with one procedure? Yeah, with, um, with, with certain ablation procedures such as in um, SVTs or WPW, yeah. there's a very high success rate, more than 90% sometimes. Um, and um, the, with those patients you could potentially, with WPW, you could get rid of their accessory path and cure them. With atrial mm. fibrillation, it's more, uh, we don't have any good long-term data yet, so it's more trying to um, improve symptom, symptom control. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the procedure is that you get an electrical map of the heart, work out where something is firing off where it shouldn't be and zap yeah. it, basically. Is, so that, is that pretty much what you're doing? So with the, with the actual EP studies, electrophysiology yeah. studies, what we do is we put wires inside the heart through yeah. the groin, it's all done percutaneously. Yeah. And once we're in the heart, we can map the electrical activity inside the heart. Yeah. And once we actually find where the abnormal electrical activity is mm -hmm. and where the actual arrhythmia is arising from, yeah. we can deliver energy, most commonly in the form of radio frequency energy, mm -hmm. and ablate or, or, or create scar around the area that's causing that. And, and that will then stop it from stop conducting, so yeah. you're turning it into an insulator. Yeah, so we basically just create scar and scars it cannot conduct electricity, so um, you, we stop the rhythm in that way. So th this is a gentleman who had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and he yeah. was very symptomatic from the atrial fibrillation. He um, has had multiple episodes requiring cardioversion, and mm -hmm. was tried with antirhythmic drugs. He was tried on sotlol and flecainide. Yeah. And he failed actual management with um, pharmacological agents. And then he was um, given the option of an atrial fibrillation ablation, yeah. which is a procedure that's probably been done for about the last 10 years. And um, what it does is we, people have discovered in the last 10 years that um, atrial fibrillation, the majority of cases come from rapid discharges in the pulmonary veins. And um, this is done, no, done using a normal CT scanner with contrast injected into it. And then what we do during the actual case is we put wires in the heart. Yeah. So we put multiple electrodes through the groin into the heart. And once it's in the heart, we can collect points and, co and, and, and create a three-dimensional map of the heart. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we fuse the actual three-dimensional map that we create of the heart with the actual CT scan. And we get an accurate picture of what, what this gentleman's left atrium and pulmonary veins look like. Mm -hmm. And once we have an accurate reflection of what the actual pulmonary veins and FH anatomy is, we can manipulate a special radio frequency ablation catheter which uses radio frequency to yep. generate energy mm -hmm. and um, deliver lesions and um, ablate or create scar around the veins and prevent electrical activity so here, from the veins. So on here, on that model yeah. where you've got all the little red dots, are they the places where the abnormal activity is taking yeah, place, so all the bits that you've ablated or what? So at the beginning of the case we put a special multipolar circular cap in the veins and we work out where all the rapid discharges can come from. Yeah. And then what we do is we deliver these red dots and the red dots are all places where we've delivered energy and mm -hmm. delivered lesions to create um, scar around the veins and prevent the impulses from coming the, from the veins and breaking out into the atrium. Okay, so we so do there's actually there's a really large number of places that that discharge yeah. comes from. It's not just like a, you know, a single yeah. area. It's a, it's yeah. a whole field. Yeah, I mean, we've, we, we've done um, what's called a circumferential ablation on one side of the heart, on the left yeah. side and we, we've electrically isolated that. Mm -hmm. Some people will, will do what's called a, a spot ablation, just a blade over the area where the actual mass, where, where the electrical activity is. Yeah. But um, there, there are very, various techniques to doing this procedure, but I've done what's called a circumferential ablation and then also isolate the veins at the same time and we check at the end of the case yeah. to make sure that the vein is isolated and there's no electrical activity in the, in, in, in the veins. So this is basically um, lady, young girl, had recurrent palpitations since, uh, since childhood. So essentially she had WPW with a short PR interval. Yeah. She's got a delta wave and a broadened cuirass complex. We induced SVT or orthodromic AV reentry tachycardia, which is a reentry tachycardia. Mm. And then we performed a, um, a transeptal puncture. So we make a small hole in the atrium. 
we push a needle across the atrium, make a small hole in the atrium, yes. and then put a catheter on the mitral valve, and then, as you read, WPW is due to a little accessory muscle connection between the atrium and the ventricle. We found out where that muscle... I wasn't, but that's great, yeah, okay. We found out where that muscle connection was. I thought it was just a, an actual electrical pathway, but there's actually there's a bridge a, of a muscle. Small, yeah, small bridge of muscle that allows the actual conduction to happen. Conduction to go across from the atrium yeah. to the ventricle and bypass the AV node. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we delivered some radio frequency energy to the actual pathway. Yeah. And we successfully ablated the pathway. We got rid of the pathway and the yep. ECG after the procedure was completely normal. You can see that the it's actual much happier looking pure here. interval appears normal. Do you get any really major complications with something like this? There can be in the big um, studies. There's been up to a 6% risk of major complications. Such as? And those include a 1% risk of cardiac tamponade, 1% okay. risk of pulmonary vein stenosis, the yep. risk of um, stroke because mm -hmm. you've got catheters in the heart, yeah. in the left side of the heart, and then there's also the rare risk of um, infection, or rarely there have been cases where people have um, burned right through the heart into the esophagus and there have been a few fatalities, but oh that's fairly God. rare. So it's, um, there, there are complications associated with them. The complication rate, rate is higher than our standard ablation procedure. Mm -hmm. For, for SVT but then or for some, yeah, I was going to say for somebody with uh, with really intractable atrial fibrillation or SVT, they've got a fairly high risk of stroke and complications. Yeah, anyway. I mean, um, the, the the atrial fibrillation ablation procedure is um, is designed to to treat symptoms. It doesn't. There's no evidence that it reduces the risk of stroke. Yeah, Rafik, are these procedures available anywhere outside Perth? No, um, these procedures need um, a cath lab. Mm -hmm. They need specialised technical staff and also specialised mapping equipment and um, electrophysiology equipment so they're only available in the teaching hospitals in Perth as well as a few of the private hospitals yeah. in Perth. Rafiq, in terms of GP follow-up, apart from the warfarin, um, which we just monitor, is there anything else that we should be aware of? If there's any concern, people have chest pain, if they have shortness of breath, fever, um, I always tell my patients to get in contact with me. Mm -hmm. If they see the GP, they should contact an electrophysiologist who's familiar with the procedure yeah. and who can um, ask for advice from the cardiac electrophysiologist. Okay, so they tend to be very suspicious in that yeah. first month if they've got if unusual they've got any, symptoms. Any unusual, um, especially if they've got stroke-like symptoms, high fevers, chest pain, they have to be con they have to get in contact with a cardiac electrophysiologist. Mm -hmm. aware of, um, and what about more long-term? So your patient who's, who's had the wolf Parkinson white or some yeah. other accessory pathway and that's been ablated, they just happily go on their way after yeah. their couple of months of aspirin and they can bounce around and play basketball and we don't yeah, need if, to do anything? If they've got no other cardiac conditions, then they can go about the wolf Parkinson white once they've been for their follow-up mm -hmm. and um, they can go back and lead a completely normal life. Okay, so it's gone and it's gone yeah. and that's it. Yep. Fabulous. <laughs>But um, two things have happened really, and which is a reduction in capital costs, a substantial reduction in capital costs, and also greater competition in radiology. So those two have combined to produce really a, a model uh, that uh, allows provision of MRIs at probably 50 or 60% cheaper than they were five years ago, for example. So if you really want very um, specialised or fancy or intensive imaging for your patient because you've got someone with complex symptoms and you're sending them all the way down from the country to the city for it. How do you determine what they need? Yeah. It's interesting that I think that there's always been this sense of onus 
by re referring doctors and particularly GPs that they seem to that they need to work out the imaging algorithm or what their patient needs and nothing sort of pleases a radiologist more to sort of drag us out of our dark room of irrelevance and into the clinical spotlight to perhaps even either call us or write on the request and say that my patient has a, a headache a severe headache with some worrying symptoms please uh, CT or MRI as you see fit or 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 to perhaps give a call or um, you know uh, I think we, we're obviously, imaging is getting more complex, it's a, enough of a challenge for radiologists to stay abreast of what perhaps the right algorithm is. But I think what all of us don't like, which GPs in particular don't like, and I think radiologists shouldn't like, is just layering of imaging tests for, for frustrating sort of layering. So you sprain your ankle and you have an x-ray and then maybe an ultrasound and then seven weeks, eight weeks later you've still got a lot of pain and you think, well, Maybe it needs further imaging. Maybe I'll do a bone scan and it doesn't show a Taylor dome lesion, but you're still not winning. And then off to a specialist, then have an MRI and back to the specialist. And then you know the gap is added up to six, eight hundred dollars for the patient. And you know I would encourage GPs to think about that. What is the real cost for the patient of of doing alternate imaging or, or perhaps referring to a specialist simply to try and get them a reasonably priced MRI. And the patients are, are very grateful in these situations. And they're often situations like, say, stress fractures or, um, uh, you know, patients who've got joint pain and they've had an X-ray and ultrasound. It hasn't really clearly shown the diagnosis. This would be a typical one where this woman has had ankle pain. She'd been hiking in Thailand for six weeks or so and she'd had a X-ray and ultrasound, a nuclear study, and and a CT, and all of which had failed to show any significant abnormality. And on that CT, on the first slide, there's just a small ankle joint effusion, but really nothing specific. So she eventually came to MRI, and what the MRI shows, you can see her talus bone there on the sagittal image is white, mm -hmm. whereas the other bones are dark. And that says she has diffuse edema of her talus, which is uh, just a... Not That's a, a water content thing, yeah? It's water, yeah, water in the talus. So her pathology is in the talus, and it's diffuse. And it's in this particular situation, it's in a, just a, a so-called bone marrow edema syndrome. It's a little bit like transient osteoporosis of the hip, the same category of uh, symptom or, or spinal spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee and these syndromes are intensely painful and they do burn out in three or four months time and they're managed conservatively. So you might ask what was the point of imaging but I think that uh, imaging always, if you do the right test first up, it stops further tests, it stops anxiety, it stops further expense, arthroscopies, etc. And you're able to reassure your patient and say, this is what they it know is, when it's gonna this stop. is what we're going to do. And so, yes, all the other tests were perfectly valid but I think that often when you when your clinical sense is you know it could be, there's a few things this could be and you and and in most cases MRI is the best single test to diagnose it and you know you've got a patient who is not really up for two or three or four different appointments to find that answer then you should really consider the MRI if it's going to be fast then country patients often choose that yeah indeed now i've had some patients who've had CT scanning and particularly three-dimensional CT scanning and it looks pretty damn impressive. Yeah, yeah. How do you tell when when to do a, a CT scan yeah. with all that radiation yeah. and when to do an MRI scan? Yeah, well there's sort of, there's certain key clinical situations where you would definitely do a CT. Mm -hmm. uh, complex trauma, which so acute severe trauma, so road traffic accidents or somebody who's got an open fracture. Um, so CT is very good for bones and then uh, tiny bones, so the middle ear stuff, but that would often come from an ENT specialist. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, CT is probably king over MRI, acute subarachnoid hemorrhage, but only just really. If you, if you requested an MRI inadvertently, if you like, it's not going to miss the subarachnoid. It's, you'd have to be, be unlucky to miss it, but CT is probably a little bit more sensitive. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd recommend is a website, which many of the GPs are aware of now, called the Diagnostic Imaging Pathways, DIP which is run through Royal Perth and um, if you can just find it on Google and it has very nice imaging algorithms for different situations. And Connor, could you talk us through some of the amazing CT images yeah, that you get sure. and particularly the new advances in coronary CT yeah, scans? Yes, absolutely. Um, this gentleman uh, is 73 and he got referred by a cardiologist for a chest CT with shortness of breath and he'd had some asbestos exposure, which is a pretty common presentation. But what I want to show you is something at the cutting edge of CT. Really, it's cardiothoracic CT, which is gating of the, of the scan for the, for the heart. And we use gating for coronary CT, but mm. what I've discovered, if you like, or what we've discovered is that with the ultra-fast modern CTs is that you can get um, beautiful functional uh, data of the heart that I think challenges all present modalities, including echo and MRI. And um, we use it certainly on every 
case. So we look at our cases now in 3D and now in 4D, and it gives you diagnosis, and, and uh, probably almost a daily basis it can make a difference to your diagnosis, which is quite amazing to me. And so he hadn't had an echo yet, uh, this chap, um, and so he first had a chest CT, and as we go through the chest CT, we'll all be kind of used to this sort of axial imaging, and, uh, but I would start all my CTs now in 4D, which is more than, a, uh, 3D rather, which is more than a gimmick. You see the most interesting things on patients, skin surfaces, lesions, lumps, bumps, you get a sense of the patients, you know, if they've got central obesity, or as in this case, you very quickly realise, oh, hang on, he's had his sternum zipped open here, there's a line there. And as you come in, you go, okay, he's got sternal wires, He's had a, probably a coronary artery bypass, so we're going to need to look at that because he's short of breath. And not only that, the most common cause of pericardial constriction these days is previous coronary artery bypass surgery. So already those things are floating through my mind. Uh, but quickly, very quickly, we get into our more traditional sort of um, uh, imaging plane, and we notice that this chap has a fair bit of pleural plaque disease here, which is likely related to asbestos, and he has some atelectasis down here, again asbestos related, some pleural effusions, asbestos related. No obvious pulmonary fibrosis and not, not much else. His lungs look pretty good otherwise. He doesn't have a lot of emphysema or bronchitis, and so well, no sort of definite cause for shortness of breath other than a small pleural effusion, and that is a small effusion, although they always look a bit bigger on CT. And so we also, because it's a gated study for free, if you like, we get to look at his um, coronary arteries, and um, this is just one of his coronary arteries here, his right coronary artery, which we see has got a little bit of plaque, but there's no narrowing there at all. And we note that this fella also has uh, coronary artery bypass grafts, and here's the left internal mammary artery graft coming all the way down to the LAD, and there's no problem there, no stenosis. Again, in 3D, we can look at these grafts, a vein graft and an LAD. So thus far, we said, oh, well, no obvious pulmonary or airways cause for shortness of breath. He's got a small effusion, a bit of atelectasis. His grafts look good and everything looks fine. And I think in 3D land, that's state of the art and, and as far as we could take this case. So here what we've got is a 4D image, and you'll notice it's very grainy, and that's because to keep the radiation as low as possible, we turn the x-rays down, or the machine turns the x-rays down really low during the phases of the cardiac cycle where the heart is moving, because we want to really capture the heart when it's still. So you see in systole, when the heart is, is, has a short still uh, moment, that the radiation goes up and we see the heart quite well. But that sort of dose modulation, as we call it, doesn't prevent us from getting a very nice look at the heart. And in this fellow, this doesn't seem to be any obvious problem with the, the function of the heart or the systolic function. But uh, we would routinely cut in now, just as you would on an echo or an MRI of the heart, and go through and look at the heart in all its various imaging planes uh, and, and see how we're going. And what we notice with this left ventricle, it's pretty good. It contracts really well and his ejection fraction certainly was normal. But already on this slice you see there's a problem, there's a wall motion abnormality. This is the interventricular septum and the left ventricle should always be a donor. It should never look like a D. And what you'll notice if I slow you down here, that when the heart contracts, particularly at the end of systole, the left ventricle turns into a D or the septum collapses towards the left ventricle. And what that tells us is that there's a problem here. There's, there's, a, there's a pressure overload of the right ventricle during systole. So this person has a significant problem. And the answer to that problem is also on the CINE CT. If we go forward and we have a look at this chap's pulmonary artery, his pulmonary artery is dilated. And when I measured his pulmonary artery, it was about 34 millimetres. So he's either got pulmonary hypertension or increased flow through his pulmonary artery. Um, and CT is, shows very uh, high specificity and moderately high sensitivity for pulmonary hypertension just on the basis of the size of the pulmonary artery. But even more interesting, as we cut through this guy towards the base of his heart, we're now in the atria here. So here out the front we have the right atrium and out the back we have the left atrium. And what that bright white stuff is, intravenous contrast. And that contrast should never make its way across the heart from the right atrium to the left atrium. But what we see in this fellow is that we are seeing that. So what you see here is the interatrial septum, and there's a little bit of contrast on the other side. So, so he's got a little ASD. Indeed, it? indeed. So this person has a communication between his right and left atrium here. So what it tells us is two things. One is there's a hole, and secondly there's a hemodynamic problem, because you, sh you should never get blood go across mm. from the right to the left. So we've already decided that his pulmonary artery is big and that he's got a hole in his heart. So there's really only two situations. Only he's got pulmonary hypertension or 
He's had a chronic left-to-right shunt, which has now become a right-to-left shunt, the so-called Eisenmenger's physiology. So we've, in this chap, we've basically said, look, he has no substantial lung or airways disease. He's got some pleural disease, which is probably irrelevant. Uh, his cardiac systolic function is normal, but he has got pulmonary hypertension, and there's shunting across a PFO or ASD. So really a very comprehensive diagnosis for mm. one test, one appointment. So really what we've got now with chest CT is a much more comprehensive answer to the question of shortness of breath or chest pain. Yep. So, uh, you know, you can rule out uh, with good accuracy, you know, systolic dysfunction of the heart, um, coronary artery disease, obstructive coronary artery disease, and uh, also rarer entities but important entities such as um, heart f uh, systolic heart failure and pericardial constriction. And Connor, patients coming down from the country, mm. they'll have to come to Perth for all of these tests? Uh, yeah, look, I think things get rolled out and they obviously get, tend to get rolled out from the bigger centres slowly out to the country. Um, this sort of, uh, firstly regards the cut price MRIs, and I, I wouldn't want to be quoted because things change, but I'm only aware of three uh, sites or three MRI machines in Perth that provide that to GPs, but three is better than none. I think it's inevitable that that will grow. In fact, I know it is. There'll be one or two more MRIs within 12 months that, that directly target GPs. Uh, it will ha you'll find in the next two or three years there'll be a number of country centres as well. And the CT, this sort of 4D chest CT is kind of an interest area and it's probably only available at where I, I'm working centrally in the city. But soon it'll get rolled out in the teaching hospital shortly. And our thanks to Dr. Connor Murray from Princess Margaret Hospital for taking the time to talk with us. Well, finally tonight, we spoke with radiation oncologist Dr. Yvonne Zizadis from Perth Radiation Oncology about the expanding role and application of radiotherapy. Yvonne, country cancer patients sometimes elect not to have radiotherapy because of all the extra travel that that involves. In what sort of cancer is it absolutely essential or would you recommend that that they bite the bullet and do the travelling? Um, really, for, for most cancers, um, often we have a choice in their treatment schedule, so we can try and give them a shorter schedule using slightly bigger doses every day. Now, that doesn't work for all cancers. It doesn't work for the gynaecological or the head and neck cancers where it's essential that they don't have any um, breaks in their treatment. But other treatments, such as breast cancer, often have a slightly shorter alternative that we do offer G um, country patients if they're not willing to come up here for five or six weeks. Mm -hmm. And also skin cancers are the other ones that we can always um, try and um, cater to the patient in terms of treatment schedules. Yeah. So could you describe a typical treatment schedule? What's involved? Well, I'll probably use breast cancer because that's a very common one. Yeah. Um, generally, it'll be five or six weeks of treatment. Um, sometimes we offer a shorter three and a half week schedule for older patients or country patients, um, which is based on a Canadian schedule. They need to be here every day, Monday to Friday, for about 10, 15 minutes for their treatment. And they'll be well, they can drive themselves in, park their car outside the door and come in for their treatment and then go home again. Often country patients will be staying in accommodation not too far from here mm -hmm. and there is transport already organised for those patients. And it sounds pretty exhausting. It is exhausting. What do they expect for the rest of the time that they're actually in Perth having, having treatment every day? Um, generally, most patients can get on and do their normal tasks. They'll be well enough to go shopping, they'll be well enough to cook for themselves and um, usually do some gentle exercise such as a half hour walk. They'll be well enough to do that. They'll just find that they get tired more easily. And when they come back to us in the country, which is of course at the end of their treatment regime, you often find that they've got quite severe mucous membrane or skin inflammation. Some of them have even had their teeth taken out. Um, can you tell us what's happening there and how we help them deal with those mm. problems? Generally, most of the side effects are due to local inflammation from the radiotherapy. And it tends to be self-limiting and, and get better by itself. Yeah. But it can take, it usually takes anywhere from three to five to six weeks for it to improve. And the main thing they need is really some nurturing along the way and symptom control. Once the patients had their planning appointment, um, we generate a CT scan, a planning CT scan, which is then mounted um, on our computer. What we mark on 
<coughs> are the, the areas of interest that we want to treat. Yeah. And for this patient, um, there's pelvic nodes that have been marked out in, in um, green. Um, there's a pelvic mass, which is marked out in the yellow. And then what we do is put on a margin for uh, movement and for microscopic disease. And then we work out, the planners will work out what beam arrangement gives the best dose distribution in the treatment volume and trying to spare the other tissues, and namely the, um, the bladder in this case. Um, we protect them by using um, multiple beams yeah. and uh, changing the angle of the beams and the weighting of the beams so that we can miss out the bladder and the, the rectum for this woman. In order to avoid treating the bladder and the rectum, often what happens is you get slightly higher doses in the peripheries. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, we just need to let the patients know that they probably will get some um, skin change, some skin reaction, but it'll be very mild, probably just a little bit of red dry skin, not a burn. So what's your favourite thing for, uh, for, say, the burnt skin? The burnt skin, look, I keep it simple. If, um, if it's just erythema, you know, like a severe erythema and it's mm -hmm. itchy, we usually use some Dermavine or some Dermese cream, which is like a thick yes. gel, uh, an emollient. Yep. Um, if there's skin breakage, I actually give Silverzine cream, SSD, and saline baths, that's the other thing. Nice and simple, good old salt water, mm -hmm. twice a day, and that's usually sufficient. And what's with the taking the teeth out? Head and neck is a, I guess, a, a slightly different area. Patients get higher doses um, of radiation and often get a lot of local side effects, which is the mucositis and the ulceration. And they are at risk of um, uh, bone necrosis. Mm -hmm. So if there's any problem with any of their teeth, they get extracted before they start their treatment because they're at high risk of getting um, osteoradionecrosis. And is there anything prophylactic that the patients could do beforehand to make their... I mean, obviously they can't plan to have cancer on the 23rd of the month, but, um, you know, to make their radiotherapy course a little easier? They need to stop smoking. Uh, they need to have good oral hygiene and not take any alcohol during their treatment. Because of the, um, the mucositis? It really does burn on the way down. So we generally tell them not, you know, to avoid the alcohol. But, but and also smoking is well proven to increase toxicity during radiation. And finally, Yvonne, you mentioned that patients with skin cancer could respond quite well to radiotherapy. And we do occasionally get patients who have pretty extensive, say, BCCs on their nose that have crawled out from under a, yes. a, a skin graft or whatever. Um, very topical for country patients. Mm -hmm. How applicable is it? Do you, can you radiate all BCCs? Oh, absolutely. Um, BCCs are very responsive, as are SECs. Um, melanomas are a different category, but definitely basal cells and squamous cells, very amenable to radiotherapy. Um, I think often the treatment of choice for the more elderly patients, rather than extensive surgery with grafting, um, it, it's just an easier treatment to have. You know, they come in and they have 10 minutes of treatment. They just need to be mobile enough to come for the treatment. But we often, for um, those patients, often give twice weekly treatments, say over a three week period. So a reasonably extended stay in Perth, but not a terribly toxic kind of treatment. Do they go out then with something that just looks like a sunburnt nose? They do. Initially, it looks like a sunburn. And then often it scabs, and then the scab will drop off about three or four weeks later. And they're usually left with um, quite smooth skin. And, and then it's slightly, there's, it gets paler, so they have pale, smooth skin. They often want the rest of their nose done after <laughs> we've finished. And um, how successful is it? Is this something that you can say, OK, we can definitely cure most BCCs this yeah, way? Yeah, we can. The ones that are very difficult to treat are the ones that have gone into, you know, sort of deeper structures. So once there's bone involvement, they need surgery and radiation um, on t after the surgery. But if, if they're not involving cartilage or bone, the radiation is extremely good. And our thanks to radiation oncologist Dr Yvonne Zizardis from Perth Radiation Oncology for her time on this program. And indeed a big thank you once again to everyone involved in tonight's program for taking the time to fit us into their busy schedules. 
That's about it for this broadcast. If you'd like to review this or any previous broadcast at another time, you can simply go to our website at www.ruralhealthwest.com.au and watch the programs live or download them as video or audio podcasts. We'll be back again on the 1st of June with the program that will focus on diabetes. Once again, from everybody at Rural Health West, thanks for taking the time to join us. I'm Jerry Gannon. Good night. Thank you.